Well, good morning, Broadway Baptist Church on a rainy Sunday morning. Man, oh man, I tell you what, something really strange has happened that uh, today. I, I had to kind of check and make sure that I'm really in a Baptist church. Seems like you guys are moving up rather than moving back, you know? Or at least moving around or something. I It's like all these people sitting over here. Did you guys take that serious when I said last week that uh, you're sitting in the center section, S-I-N-N-E-R, the center section, and now you're moving off to the left. It's like the parting of the Red Sea this morning, man. I tell you, it is great to see you guys in the Lord's house. How many of you are happy to be here today? How many of you, how many of you just happy to be anywhere today? That's good, man. I'm telling you, and I'm really glad that uh, missionary to Belgium, Debbie Taylor, is here with us. Raise your hand one more time. See, there you go, right there. Debbie is going to be with us all day today. She was actually here last night. Some of you got to meet her last night. And uh, she's got her table in the back. It's the one with the Smurfs on it. Some of you are going, Smurfs? What in the world? Well, anyway, I know there's the story to that. And hopefully we'll hear that eventually. Today, we get the, this morning, we get the video. Tonight, she'll do her presentation, answer questions. And, of course, we already uh, support her folks, Larry, uh, in, is in Belgium, and they're doing great, man, I tell you. And what's your mom's name again? Jean. Larry and Jean. And, and so uh, uh, she is on deputation right now to go back and work with them in Belgium. And so uh, we're going to be hearing from her throughout the day today and really, really excited that you're here with us. Thank you so much. And we're also excited that our guests are here with us today. If you received a, a bulletin when you came in, it has a fold-out portion to it. It folds out and it tears out. If you don't mind filling that out and placing it in the offering plate when it comes by, that will be a record of uh, your visit with us today, and we'd appreciate you doing that so, so very much. Well, it's it's uh, you guys are here for day three this morning. Been uh, day one two weeks ago on Sunday morning on Friend Day. Day two last week on Resurrection Sunday, and today, day three, we actually get to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. So, really excited about that, and we've also got a few other announcements for you as well. Uh, Andrew's actually up manning the sound system, so I just want to, on behalf of, of Andrew today, say a great big thank you to everybody that helped out last night at the uh, barbecue banquet, April Kim uh, Posey, James, John Hamilton, Michael, and of course, those that donated the meat. Thank you so, so much. Please give yourselves a big round of applause for last night. I am so sorry that we had to miss it, but uh, we did have a birthday party that uh, in our family we had to attend yesterday, and so we were on the road yesterday all day long. And uh, so uh, thankful that uh, you guys had it all. It's about 70 folks here uh, last night, 70, 74, isn't that about right? This is what you told me. And how much was raised, Andrew? Just under $1,200, man. How cool is that? That gets the kids, that gets the kids closer to camp. And then our big last fundraiser is coming up here in about a month and a half. And that, of course, is our annual pie auction and fellowship that will happen right after Sunday morning church. Boy, that's always a great time and uh, always a, a very uh, lucrative time. Not just, I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about for the souls that uh, get saved and get to go to camp and get encouraged. And boy, I tell you, just uh, it's a great time of year as we get uh, ready for the summertime. All right, some announcements. Uh, Brother Phil, what you got today? Uh, yes, this, this coming Thursday, we do have birthday buddies across the street at SIS. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that and be able to go over there and take cupcakes and uh, juice over there to the kids who have, uh, who have April birthdays, uh, just come meet us at 245. We'll go across the street, give those uh, the kids, be able to sing happy birthday to them and everything. And so it's, it's just a blessing. Being, it's a treat uh, for them to be able to get a, be a part of that as well. Okay, I'm going to do the... Three ladies' announcements. Ladies, you guys dominate the bulletin today, okay? Ladies' painting class is next Saturday at 1. See Rochelle, or is Miss Janice here? I don't see Miss Janice yet, but uh, but Rochelle uh, uh, will uh, take care of you and tell you all about that if you're interested in next Saturday's painting class. Then Mother's Day is two weeks from today. 
That's crazy, isn't it? So uh, we'll be celebrating our ladies during Sunday school on Mother's Day morning. At 9.30, we'll have a breakfast for you and uh, some great music, some special speaking, and uh, just a wonderful time. There's usually, not uh, now I'm not maybe a little presumptuous, but there's usually even some prizes that come along with just being, is that right? Possibly? Uh, maybe? I don't know. Well, it could be a surprise this, this time around. But uh, uh, thank you guys for what you'll do, and thank you for all you do as we uh, celebrate you at our ladies' breakfast coming up in two weeks at 9.30 in the morning. Then uh, the next night is Wings for May. Wings is Women in God's Service, and that'll be at 6.30 on Monday night. We'll be telling you more about that in the next few days. Also, prayer breakfast, right? Uh, yes, coming up on May 14th. This is for our men's. Our men prayer breakfast will be on that Saturday morning at 8 a.m. So come, uh, are, you, are you men, be able to go and be able to get a good breakfast, be able to get here a devotion, and just kind of just be able to hang out and just fellowship together. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to go see a Texas Ranger game. How many games have they won now? Two? They won three in a row. Three in a row? Yes. yes. See, I just gave up on them. They were two in like ten in last place in the whole kit and caboodle, and now they won three in a row. So yep. uh, who knows? But anyway, we're going to look for uh, to go to another game this year, Friday, July 15th. Basically, what we're trying to ask you to do right now is just make sure your calendar's empty to go that, uh, that Friday night to the game, and we'll get a sign-up sheet out pretty quick. And uh, also some information on how much tickets are going to be. Because I think we're going to set somewhere different this year, not the all-you-can-eat seats. Because the all-you-can-eat seats now at the new stadium, you got to walk half a mile to get to the all-you-can-eat. And you miss half the game because there's a long line. And basically, it's just a bad deal. All right? That's what I'm saying. So uh, we're going to get some different seats this year and uh, let you know about those. Then, Vacation Bible School is almost yes, here. Yes, it's hard to believe that Vacation Bible School is only about five to six weeks away. It's hard to believe it's already... Uh, that time. And so we do have a sign-up sheet back there at the, on the Welcome Center if you're able to go and to help this year. We'd love to have you just kind of sign up. That way we know, you know, how many volunteers we have working. Uh, but then also next Sunday morning, right after services, we'll probably have just a quick five-minute meeting uh, to go over a few things about Vacation Bible School. The Rangers really have one three in a row? You're not just kidding me? No, yes, I promise. Well, I mean, I'm, have... in, I'm in church. I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can, but it's not advised. Oh, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Three in a row, really. Yes, All right. Yes. Good. Deal. Okay. Who knew? All right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started with our Sunday morning service. Man, I'm excited to be here, and hope you are too. Hang on. I've got to give a private message to Phil real quick. Will you please turn the air conditioner on? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for your care and your compassion for us. Thank you that we get to celebrate you this morning. Lord, for us as believers, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We remember on this first day of the week the victory that you had and continue to have over the grave. We are thrilled then to be your sons and your daughters because of what you have done for us and the sacrifice that you made for our sins. Thank you so much for the victory that we have and know and may we may we just relish what you have done for us today and may you give us the encouragement that we need as the days move forward, as we get closer and closer to seeing you face to face. Lord, I pray today if someone is not prepared for that day, that day that we indeed meet you face to face, that today will be the day that we start a relationship with you. And may your Holy Spirit just shroud the service today, come down and Speak to each and every one of us individually, privately, personally. Praise you and thank you for all that you do in this next hour together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing. To God be the glory. Why? Because great things he has done. 
Let's sing it together. It's page 66. The words will be on the screen as we sing it out together. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin. And open the light gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us. Great things He hath done. And great on rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He had done. Lord, you have done great things, and we praise you and thank you so much today. And uh, we want to express how much we thank you through our giving today and through our worship today. So as we worship through our giving, may you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated as we sing together one of our favorites as the ushers move throughout, Jesus Messiah. Let's lift it up together today as we sing. Here we go. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. What so amazing Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin.
Today he is our Messiah, our Emmanuel. Tell you what, one day he came and he did what nobody else could do as we sing this great hymn together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. Let's sing it out this morning. All right, here we go. One day when heaven was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt amongst men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he Justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. All right, keep it going now. One day the grave, one day the grave could conceal Him no longer. One day the storm rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death, the had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Okay, hold on just one more time. One day the trumpet. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved ones bringing, glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Now let me hear you sing the chorus one more time. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me. Can't hear you. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, freely forever, and one day he's coming, oh, glorious day. With your singing today, I almost believe that. You've almost convinced me that one day he's coming. Is he? Man, are we anxious for his arrival? I hope so. I hope you're a little more energetic when he gets here than you are. But that's okay. It is the first cloudy, rainy day we've had in a long time. But can we say, somebody bless God, the wind's not blowing today? Can we just say amen to that together? I'm telling you. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. Great singing this morning. Miss Debbie, you don't be seated. You come on up here, please. Miss Debbie Taylor, so glad she's with us. Not only today, I talked to her the other day on the phone, and she can be able to be with us all day today, and glad for that. So uh, she's going to show us a video this morning, but I want you to introduce that video for us and uh, tell us just a little bit about yourself. Hi, 
I'm Debbie Taylor. Um, I am actually, well, most of you guys know my parents, actually. So I'm a second generation of missionary, and I have the privilege of getting to go back and working with them. Um, I have been with them for the last six years, but I get to do this full time, and I'm so excited to be able to embark on this journey and work with them. And so my video will talk a little bit about um, just what I'm up against a little bit. And then tonight, I highly encourage you to come back, and I'm going to share my story of how God has gotten me where I am today. All right, let's show the video. All right, Brother Phil's got the lights. Okay. My name is Debbie Taylor. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. In 1978, my parents moved to Belgium to become church planning missionaries. So I grew up in the French-speaking part of Belgium, immersed in culture and the language, all the while growing in my own faith, ministering in my local church, and learning how to share it with the people around me. After graduating from BBC with a missions degree, I later returned to Belgium and started actively serving in my church because my heart is burdened for the young adults here in Belgium. 65% of young adults here don't believe that there is a God, and culture berates them that faith is obsolete and illogical. Belgium has a rich culture and history. It is a land of chocolate, french fries, and waffles. And some of its history includes the defeat of Napoleon, the invention of the saxophone, and even the creation of the Spurs. In most recent years, its notoriety comes from being the heart of Europe, as the headquarters of the EU resides in the capital city of Brussels. It's truly a melting pot of cultures. Brussels and its suburbs house 2.5 million people, and that is almost a quarter of the entire country's population with over 12 universities. And as of 2020, there are over 86,000 students studying in Brussels. That is why God has called me into being more than just working in a church, but to become a full-time missionary. Bonjour, euh, moi c'est Pauline. Euh, Debbie, elle a impacté positivement ma vie, spécialement au camp, euh, parce qu'elle a toujours été là pour euh, guider, instruire les filles, euh, nous aider quand on avait des questions. On peut toujours venir euh, vers Debbie, en tout cas, euh, quand on a des soucis, ou même pour de la guidance. Et pour moi, Debbie est super essentiel à avoir un ministre en Belgique parce que un ministère, pardon, un ministère en Belgique parce que bah, elle a toujours été ici. Euh, elle connaît le public belge, elle parle français, euh, elle est en contact euh, constamment avec des étudiants, moi, tous les gens autour de moi. Et euh, as un contact entre elles, un contact facile avec euh, les jeunes, ça vient naturellement. Et, euh, et elle est toujours là pour nous. Bonjour, moi c'est euh, Amandine. J'ai rencontré Déborah au camp il y a tellement longtemps quand j'étais enfant et depuis elle a vraiment changé ma vie. Donc c'est un peu difficile de me dire ok une seule chose de pourquoi est-ce qu'elle a impacté ma vie. Mais en tout cas depuis que je suis ado et que je suis enfant, je... elle a toujours été mon enseignante et jusqu'à maintenant en tant que jeune adulte. Et donc elle, elle gère nos groupes le jeudi soir et en même temps aussi elle nous enseigne le mardi. Euh, pour comment enseigner les enfants. Donc, euh, enfin, on voit vraiment une transition à travers les années, qu'elle a toujours été là. Mais oui, je pense que Déborah, c'est vraiment la personne... Euh, enfin, c'est un peu difficile d'imaginer mon église sans Déborah. Euh, et donc je pense qu'il n'y a pas une autre personne qui pourrait prendre sa place. Vraiment, elle connaît les étudiants, elle sait comment parler aux, aux, aux jeunes, euh, comment enseigner les jeunes. It is crucial that these young adults make a connection with God and are mentored to reach their own generation. With your help, 
and the tools and experiences that God has already equipped me with, we can make a difference. Less than a half of 1% claim to know Christ as a Savior. God has allowed me to be involved in various outreaches and ministries such as Sunday School, Music Ministry, Summer Youth Camps, Kids Camps, Ladies Retreats, Paint Parties, Scrapbooking, a weekly young adult small group, and even training teachers. My prayer is to be fully supported by next summer. As I'm already in the field, I would love for you to partner with me in reaching the future generations for Christ. As you can tell, we have a suitcase up here. And if you're going to suitcase, if you have a suitcase, what does that mean usually mean? Going on a trip, you're going, you're going somewhere, you're traveling. You know, the Bible talks about, and the acronym I've always heard from the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. So one day, so I've kind of just, just used a Suitcase here. Let me turn it around here. You got several things inside here because you know I was looking at a watching, uh, watching, well, look, I uh, listening to a study the other night, and it was talking about I don't know who they surveyed, but it said eleven percent of Christians actually read their Bible every day. Just eleven percent. Next day, I don't know who they get their study, for, study from. They never did ask me or anything like that. I'm sure they may want to say they ever asked you or not. But they got it. They, 11% of the people that they studied or that they asked that question, only 11% of the Christians actually picked up their Bible and read it each day. And so as a, as a Christian, we know how important the Bible is. It's also vitally important we know that these kids, and they need to start going and learning the, about the Bible, start, start learning to read the Bible and everything and getting the love for the Bible now. That way, as they grow up, they'll have that love and passion for the Bible. So we go, we have a few things here. The Bible uses different symbols and everything when it refers to the Bible. One, one part talks about just the milk. That's just chocolate milk. And I'm sure, as far as it talks about the Bible, talks about the, the milk and everything the Bible refers to as the milk. We know also that the Bible talks about a mirror. It talks about as you go and you can look yourself as you read the Bible, it's almost like a mirror. It goes and it, it goes and it tells us how you go and you need to maybe there's some change things in your life you need to change. You know, if I looked in the mirror this morning, I mean, I don't have to worry about my hair, but there's some other things I might have to go and change a little bit here and there. But the Bible, as we go and we read the Bible, God says it's like a mirror. It goes and it helps us. We can go and we can see things we need to change. The Bible mentions gold and honey. I don't have any gold for it to be valuable, but I don't have any honey, but there's a bee that kind of represents as far as uh, the bee, the, uh, the honey. The, the Bible is, is sweet to us. The Bible is a light. We know that for it, is, it talks about God is our, our light. It kind of guides us. He guides our path. Talk about water. Now, me and water, we've become pretty good friends the last few months. And let me tell you, the water, especially back in the Bible days, it was hot. It was dry. People, they thought of water not only as, eh, I'll drink it. It was a necessity. 
It was a source of their, their, their life. It was important for them. It was precious to them. And as Christians, we need to make sure, and as, as kids, we need to make sure that our Bible that is precious to us, that the Bible is a necessity for us. The Bible also mentions a hammer. Even in Jeremiah, it talks about a hammer. The Bible's like a hammer. The Bible talks about as far as it is a, like a sword. It says it cuts. It's like a double-edged sword. It cuts, it, it cuts through the heart. And this is one that I don't have it hooked up just yet, but it's, it has a thing where you can do a flaming sword. But it's a sword that would go and it cuts through our heart. It convicts us. As we go and we read God's Word, God's, there's, it, it, well, God's Word convicts us. Sometimes it goes and it, we know that it encourages us. But God's Word is, is also known as a sword. We know also that the Bible... It goes, and it talks also about in Jeremiah, and it is like a fire. The Bible talks about as far as this, the Bible is a, is, a, is a fire. And that is something that we need to make sure that we know as the Bible. The things there in the Bibles are important to us. We go and we base our life and our life on the Bible how we go when God guides us. And I haven't got the chance to play with fire in a while, as you all know, so I couldn't pass it up. But this is important as far as we go in, in the Bible. It's important for us to, to, to know as Christians that we need to learn as much as we can in the Bible. I always heard that phrase as far as what you do with the Bible determines what God does with you. You know what, if you're into the Bible, you want to be used by God, you want to be, do, do some great things for God, then we have to get into His Word. And so that is just for just a few things, and there's, many, there's other symbols that God uses about the Bible, but we need to make sure that the Bible is important to us. We need to make sure we have that passion for the Bible, to get into the Bible. All right, let's go ahead and bow our head for prayer, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, Lord, just thank you for today. Just thank you for the rain that... Uh, that we are experiencing right now. We just thank you so much for that. And just for our, our special guests that are here this morning, for uh, Miss Debbie, Lord, just being able to go, come here and just be able to go into show her video and just, and just talk to, talked about the field that you've called her to, the, the field of Belgium. Lord, I pray, Lord, just to help each one of us today, Lord, as we go and we look into our own, in our own lives, Lord, and see how is the, and ask the question, is the Bible precious to me? How, 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 how important is the Bible to me, Lord? And maybe I pray, Lord, just to, to speak to our hearts about getting more into the, the Bible as you would have us to be. Lord, pray, Lord, as we go into next door to the kids' quest, the Lord, as we go and we have the missions time, as we go and we hear more about you, the Lord, that we can just apply these things, the things that we hear, that we can go and our love for you and our passion for you will grow. We ask things in the most precious name. Amen. The cross is my beginning The line drawn in the sand The end of all my striving Now I am born again There Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is
cross needs no addition. His mercy is complete. His love is not in question. The Son of God has spoken over me. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Grace is here. Love is triumphed over death forever. Strongholds bowing to the Savior resurrection power over every circumstance his word stands final and forever it will not be shaken he alone has won it all strongholds bowing to the Savior resurrection final and forever it will not be shaken he alone has won it all it is done it is finished Christ has won he is risen grace is here love has triumphed Lord, you alone are worthy of our praise today. We thank you for the time we could spend together, but we don't want it just to be time that we fill in our lives. We ask you to make it time that impacts everything about us. Thank you for how the music has already impacted us, the video. And now we come to your word, which we know is going to impact us. I'm praying that right now, trusting you to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, three days that changed the world forever. We're on day three. I know the calendar said last week was Resurrection Sunday, but let me tell you something right now. Every Sunday should be celebrated by the believer as Resurrection Sunday. I believe that's the reason why in the New Testament church they began to get together and worship on Sunday. 
and why we have carried that throughout the church age. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is really for the New Testament the resurrection chapter. So we'll read about 17 or so verses of the, well there's a long lot of them, 58 total in the uh, chapter, but we won't get all the way through that today. We'll begin in verse 1 here in just a few minutes. By the way, how many of you the next time that sword comes out are going to be really nervous? I've already determined that when I see that sword, maybe I'll just go find it in his office and hide it. <clears throat> or let him know that before he uses it again or brings it out again that I need to know to make sure that our church insurance is up to date. So uh, whichever way, that'll be all right. Now, I don't know about you, but I have had some good days in this life. Yeah, I really have. I've had some days that really stand out as good days in this life. The day I was saved, the day I knelt beside my bed and, and was born again. Now, I don't remember the day I was born. Weird, right? I don't remember May 29th, 1968. I don't remember that day. But I do remember the day I was born again. I do remember about what time it was. And I remember where I was. And I remember praying and asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and save me as a six-year-old boy. I remember that. That was a good day. Um, the day I was baptized. Also a fairly memorable day because I was scared to death of the water. And therefore, very trusting that my pastor, Brother Tommy Sutherland, would actually bring me back up from being dunked, you know? I mean, we had heart-to-heart -heart discussions about this. And that was a level of trust that I had to put into my pastor, and, and uh, he didn't hold me under for too long. The day I was married, boy, that was a good day. April 14th, 1990, 32 years ago now. Wow, that was a great day. I'll never forget shaking in my rented shoes up front. But everything really got, I mostly was shaking because I was like, is she really going to show up? And then she was there in the back of the church. Yeah, coming to meet me at the altar to get married. That was a good day. Man, a really good day. Each of the three days that our three kids were born, I was there for each one. A Monday morning, really early, for Bethany, our oldest. A Thursday, really early in the morning, for Andrew, like about 3.30 in the morning, early, for Andrew, on the middle of a rainy night in Dallas. And then another Thursday, but this was a little later on in the night, for Abby. Great days, man. Get the picture? Good days? Man, I'm telling you, there's some good days. Then there was the day. The day that I got my first hole-in-one playing golf. Can I get a witness? Come on now. First hole-in-one. I, I say first because I've had two. And uh, I've played a lot of golf since I got my second one, so I'm high, it, I'm due is what I'm saying for a third one. But the first hole in one, man, it was a great day. It was a really nice golf course right outside of Tyler, Texas, East Texas. And it was a beautiful spring day, late March. The azaleas and the dogwoods were in bloom and the birds were all singing zip. Zippity doo da, zippity a. We come to this par three a little bit down the hill with some pine trees down the left, a bunker to the right of the hole, and the green kind of shapes like this around the bunker, and the pins sitting right about 10 yards on the green, pretty close to the bunker. And I'm thinking, I can cut just a little four iron in there, 183 yards. Boy, am I sick with memory of this day or what? 
And so I tee my ball up, and I just, I give it just a nice little smooth swing. It goes up and curves around and hits on the green. One bounce, two bounce, and disappeared into the hole for a hole in one. I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know what to say. The four other guys that I was playing with were like, that just went in the hole for a hole in one. I dropped my club and absolutely just almost passed out. I mean, a hole in one, what are the odds of a hole in one? They're pretty astronomical, by the way. And I was so overcome, this was like the 15th hole of the day, that on the very next hole, I, I just hit the ball and it went about 10 yards. I mean, I was just, I was still shaking. I mean, who can do it? So, so the, the guy, make it even a better day is I wasn't even paying for the golf that day. At this really nice course on the spring day, dogwoods in bloom, azaleas, and the birds singing zippity doo dah. Went into the clubhouse, and the good day got even better. Because the guy I was playing with, who was pretty loud and paying, he said, what does a guy get around here for a hole in one? And the guy behind the counter goes, well, how about a free round of golf for your whole group? <laughs> and the guy goes, Done. This guy right here, he always called me old man. I was like 24 at the time. He was like, this old man over here just got a hole in one on number 15 and all this kind of stuff. I was like expecting a golden putter, you know, uh, uh, you know, anointed with a sword, you know. I was, I, I'm now Sir Daniel or something. Yeah. But we got a free round of golf out of it for the whole group. So that's about a $300 hole in one, so to speak. I'd have just taken the 300 bucks personally. I mean, I was a poor youth minister at the time. But I, so we got a free round of golf. Then, after that, it gets even better. After we got finished with golf, the guy who's paid for the golf and taking us on this little trip and stuff goes, why don't we go eat at Pauline's Buffet? I'm like, never heard of Pauline's Buffet. He goes, trust me, they have fried chicken there. Now, let me just tell you something. I knew I was called to the ministry when I didn't want to work anymore and I couldn't eat enough fried chicken. I love, y'all get that later. I love me some fried chicken. We go to Pauline's and he went lying and it was all you can eat. And I did. <laughs> fried chicken. And then I slept all the way home. Kim's got me a plaque. It's still in my office, by the way. You can go see it. The only bad thing about that plaque is the ball I was using, three holes earlier, I just knocked it off the cart path, so it's got a really big skid mark on the side of the ball, so I have to turn it around just so, so you don't see that in the plaque for my hole. That was a good day. I'll tell you, that was a really good day. And obviously, by the look on your face, you're going, I've had better days than that, but that's okay. We've come to realize, though, over the past couple of weeks, that there were three other days that measure up as probably the greatest days of all time. The day that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. The day that He was buried. And we know now that Jesus wasn't just hanging out. He was busy. Having been quickened by the Spirit, to go and to do some damage to the devil. And then to go on up into heaven at the right hand of the Father and say, Hey God, Dad, you know we ought to build something for our kids. Let's build heaven. On day two. But then all of a sudden on day three. The Bible describes it as being very early in the morning. When the ladies went and noticed that the stone was rolled away and an angel was there and Jesus was not there because he had risen from the grave. Now that's another great day. Let's read what Paul has to say about these three days in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. The Bible says, moreover, brethren. So Paul is talking to those who are believers in Jesus Christ. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, he's talking to you and he's talking to me. 
Moreover, brothers and sisters, I declare unto you this, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Okay, let's just take a brief stop right there and say this. We cannot forget ever what Jesus did. Okay, it's vitally important that we do not ever forget what Jesus did. Verses 1 and 2 are telling us that. The most important thing is the gospel. It's the gospel. It is the good news. That's literally what gospel means. The good news that Jesus came to earth as a man. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And we can debate about this theologically a little bit, but I believe this, that when he came down from heaven to earth as a man, that he actually availed himself of part of his godness. Because he showed us how to live a life that is not only filled with the Holy Spirit, but led by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus didn't know everything that was happening. And that's the reason why he said, when he was talking about the, the second coming, he said, nobody, nobody knows right now when it's going to happen, except for God the Father himself. Now, when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, maybe even when he was resurrected, he took on the fullness of his godness again. And that's why when you see Jesus show up again in Revelation chapter 1, John, who had been around Jesus, the God-man in the flesh, for three years or so, in Revelation 1, let's be honest, John kind of freaked out a little bit when he saw Jesus. He was like, "Woo, you're not the same one. And he went, whoop, bowed down before him. Because now he is the glorified Savior. But when he came to earth, he was the God-man. And as we know, he lived a perfect life and modeled how we are supposed to walk in the Spirit, follow the Holy Spirit, live obedient to how the Holy Spirit leads us day by day as Jesus did. And then, of course, he died as our sin sacrifice. Don't forget what Jesus did. That's the gospel. And this is, at the end of verse 1, wherein ye, we, stand. That's where we stand. That's what we stand on. That's why we get up and preach about it every Sunday. That's why we think about it every day, hopefully. That's why we're thankful for it. That's why we are affected by what Jesus did. The gospel. These are important things for us to remember every day. We base our faith. By the way, the Bible tells us we walk by faith and not by sight. So we base our faith on the gospel. Let's read a little further. Verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now think about that verse just for a second. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also got from somebody else. Okay? Now, my parents, my mom and my dad and my grandparents are and were believers in Jesus Christ. And so for the first five plus years of my life, they modeled Jesus in front of me. They told me about Jesus. They took me to church. I learned all the songs. The songs, some of the songs we've sung today, I have known since I was whoop, about that tall. All right? I mean, by the way, One Day is my mom's favorite song. So naturally, I would have learned that song really, really young. And so these are things that they told me about so that ultimately when I was six and got saved, I received myself. So you had to kind of think about that for a second. First of all, if you've received 
Jesus, are you transferring that to somebody else? Are you showing it to somebody else? Are you living it in front of somebody else? Secondly, you have to think, man, if I've never really seen that before, I may need to get around some people who can model Jesus for me. You know? Something to think about. The end of Romans, Paul actually describes the fact that he had some kinfolk, that's my language, not the end of Romans 16, but he had some kinsmen, some kinfolk that were in the faith before him. Let me tell you what I believe about that. They were praying for their kinfolk Paul, at that time known as Saul of Tarsus, the Christian persecutor and killer. And they were praying that he would be enlightened, and was he ever? one day on the road to Damascus. His life was changed forever, but I believe his kinfolk had probably already witnessed to him and shown him the grace of Jesus. All right, so we can't forget what Jesus did, but we cannot forget the days that changed the world forever. Keep reading. Verse 4, And that Jesus was... Oh, first of all, the end there, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, day one. That He was buried, that takes care of day two, and that He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. You see, the Holy Spirit-inspired writings of Paul confirms what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. Jesus died he was buried, and he rose again. Day one, day two, day three. I love what Psalm 1610 says. Put that up on the screen, Psalm 1610, because you probably won't get there as fast as I do. Psalm 1610 says, For thou wilt not leave my soul, this is a foreshadowing of Jesus talking to his Father God. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Literally Sheol. Literally the place in the middle of the earth. Okay? Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou, God the Father, wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy and at thy right hand there are pleasures, how long? Forevermore. Do you remember what we read last week in 1 Peter 3.22? 1 Peter 3.22, our text from last week said, Who is gone into heaven and is on the what? Right hand of God. Who is that? The resurrected Savior. Talked about all the way and prophesied about all the way back in Psalm 16. So we cannot at all forget about day three. Day three is this. God's confirmation to us that He has accepted Jesus as the payment for our sins. That fulfills the psalm prophecy. Jesus' resurrection is our receipt. Do you get that? Now listen. I learned a long time ago when, I was, when I've been married to Kim for a long time, always get the receipt. Because you never know when you need to take what you got back. And what's the first thing that they always ask for when you're trying to take something back? Do you have the receipt? And how many times throughout our marriage I went, uh, no. My dog ate it. I promise. It didn't work in third grade. It didn't work for the clerk at Dillard's either. So I had to learn my receipt. Guess what? When the devil comes knocking on your door and says, what do you have as proof that you're really saved? I got my receipt right here. Jesus is alive! That's my receipt. Isn't that cool? He is, and any time that you need to be reminded, just get your receipt out. Uh, 
excuse me, uh, old devil, you read 1 Corinthians 15 lately? You know it. Oh, yeah, the devil knows the word. You remember uh, Jesus uh, didn't stay dead. That's my receipt. He's alive, so I'm in him and alive too. So it's no wonder Peter would claim day three before Jesus' actual killers in Acts chapter 4. I do want you to turn over there with me. Acts chapter 4, this is not too far back, just a few books back in Acts chapter 4 and verses 7 through 10. Peter and John are standing before Jesus' killers. And uh, he is, the killers are trying to get them to quit talking about Jesus' resurrection. And so Peter says, in the face of Jesus' killers, when they were set them in the midst, Peter and John, in the midst of these Jesus killers, they asked, by what power, or by what name, have ye done this? Done what? Healed the crippled man outside the temple. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by which he is made whole, and by what means he is made whole, be it known to you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here whole before you. Now skip down to verse 18. They're still in the midst of this conversation, but they put them away for a little bit, and then they bring them back in. They called them in and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus anymore. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. If I'm telling you right now, guys, I can't help but speak that which I have seen and heard. I can't help but tell you of the fact that day one, Jesus died for my sins. Day two, he was buried but later on, Peter would understand what he was doing during his burial. We got to see that last week. He was down in hell. And he was taking care of business down there. And then he went up to heaven. And he created heaven for us. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father till day three. When he rose from the grave. And so he said, hey, we can't help but talk about this because... Who else has ever come back from the dead on his own? That's amazing, isn't it? So don't forget about the days that changed the world forever. In particular, here's what day three means to us. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, we continue to read in verse number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we continue to read in verse 5. So he was buried, he, he died, verse 3, was buried, verse 4, rose again on the third day, verse 4, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the other 12 apostles. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom a greater part remain unto this day, but some are fallen asleep, some are, have died in Christ, is what that means. After that, he was seen of James, his half-brother, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time, as Paul recalls getting to meet Jesus on the Damascus Road one-on-one. -on -one. So understand, day three means to us, as Paul is saying to the Corinthians here, that Jesus is not dead. There were plenty of people that saw him alive. So what's that mean to us? I've never seen Jesus alive, but because the word of God says these people did, 
And can the word of God lie? Hey, can the word of God lie? So if the word of God says that Jesus rose again and all these people saw him, what do we do? We believe that. We believe that Jesus is indeed alive. And so day three means something. In fact, it means everything. Because if he had stayed dead, where would we be? Following Peter's lead then, Paul declares the resurrection of Jesus on day three. Peter was preaching this before Paul came into the fold. Peter and John were telling everybody, hey, Jesus is alive. The rest of the apostles, Jesus is alive. The 500 witnesses, Jesus is alive. We saw him. James, his half-brother. Boy, Jesus, can you imagine that reconciliation? After James, his half-brother, had lived his whole life next to the Son of God and never believed, but finally came and was reconciled, can you imagine James going, Jesus, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I believe. And you know what? The resurrection is probably why he believed. The resurrection is probably what convinced him to believe. This fact then continues to teach us that God looked at what Jesus did as sufficient payment for sin according to, remember, God's rule. God's rule. Since His rule was kept by Jesus, God could not allow Him to stay in the grave. He couldn't allow Him to stay dead. He had to resurrect Him. And there is scriptural evidence over and over and over again for us. It's all over the place. Acts 4.10, 13.30, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 2.12, 1 Peter 1.18-21. 1, over and over and over again, there is proof that God raised Jesus from the dead. Paul told of the witnesses so that we would know Jesus Christ is not dead. Man. You know, we may be uh, pretty beat up by the world. And we may be kind of sitting in here today, let's be honest, a little tired, a little worn out, a little beat down. but not Jesus. So His being alive should affect our life just a little bit, shouldn't it? Now, I'm not asking you to do a couple of cartwheels and backflips, but an amen or two might not hurt. In fact, it might be cleansing. It might be worth... Uh, Waving a hanky every now and then. Because, hey, if Jesus is still alive, that means we have hope. <laughs> Amen, I see a hanky. It means that it's okay even in the midst of all that we have going on in the world today, to be just a little excited about what Jesus did. Yeah. And it means that we can actually look forward to the day when we will see Him face to face. And it should give us reason to just go ahead and tell everybody around us, hey, you know what? I know the world's bad, but I got some hope. And with my hope, can I tell you about it? Can I tell you about the fact that my God's not dead? My God is not dead. They have not made a statue of Jesus. Because Je Jesus is alive. Is He alive in your heart today? Is He alive in your life today? 
Do you want Him to be a little bit more alive in your life today? Does day three mean everything to us then? It should. Yeah, as gruesome as day one was, it had to happen. Jesus had to give His blood to fulfill God's rule. Day two, as exciting, as enlightening as it was last week. Phenomenal! But if He hadn't come back, if He hadn't been seen of all these witnesses, if He hadn't come back from the dead, you and I are just wasting our time. We're just wasting our lives. And I fear today the devil has us blindfolded to the fact because we're not as excited as we need to be about day three. He wants to suppress that excitement because he knows the minute we get a little bit, just a little shred of resurrection power running through our veins, that he's got no reply to that. Hey, The devil can't say anything as soon as you say, um, excuse me, devil, I'm not anything. But let me tell you something. Jesus is, and uh, you couldn't hold him back, could you? Because he rose again. My Jesus, my God, he is alive today. Paul told the witnesses so that we today would know that Jesus is not dead. So, we finally see God's special delivery for us. Look at verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And If Christ be not risen, then guess what, guys? Our preaching is vain. Your faith is in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so be that Christ, or excuse me, if if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Is that us? You see, I fear if that could be talking about us. Because we don't really live our lives claiming day three. Claiming day three power. Claiming day three truth. That Jesus is alive. And no wonder if that's the case, we have flimsy faith. No wonder we fall and fail and all over ourselves all the time because we're not claiming the resurrection of Jesus over death, over all. Day three matters. And Paul says... If this is the case, verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep have died in Christ. They perished. Man, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? In fact, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, if this is the case, we're all men most miserable. If he's still dead, If he's still dead, then we are just miserable. Because we have forgotten about the resurrection power of day three, I think most of us are miserable. We're not claiming it. We're not living in it. We're not excited about it. Think about the things we get excited about. A hole in one? Really? Really? When God said, son, guess what? You're not dead anymore. Now that's something to be excited about. 
A football game? Really? Really? A new job? Really? What are we really supposed to be excited about? Day three. Day three is everything. Day three is everything. That's why Paul says, look, if, if there was no day three, we'd all be miserable. We'd all be miserable. Verse 20. But now, because day three is real, is Christ risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, when Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit, death was imposed on all mankind. By man, the God-man, came also the resurrection of the dead. Jesus, on day three. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Christ the first one who was raised from the dead, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Okay, first fruits is mentioned twice here. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Verse 23, but every man is but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. You see, the first fruits go back to God's law, God's rules. Do you remember we started this whole talk three weeks ago about God's rules? And God's rules were established way back when, right? Way back when Cain and Abel were around. Cain's sacrifice, not accepted. Abel's sacrifice, accepted. Why? Because there was blood that covered the sin. That was God's rule from the very beginning. Jesus fulfilled that rule by dying on the cross. But now we get back to the rules again. You see, the first fruits go back to the Old Testament rules. It stated that the faithful believer in God was to bring the first fruits to God. The very first thing in the harvest was to be brought to God, literally to the tabernacle or temple, and given to the priest. Okay? Now, I want you to turn with me to Leviticus 23. You're going, seriously, Brother Daniel, Leviticus? Oh yeah, we're going there. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 10. Because you got to see this for yourself. Leviticus 23 and verse 10. Remember, the first fruits were given to God, believing then the believer by faith takes the first fruits to the priest, gives them to him, believing that God would then fulfill or supply the full harvest to the one who brought faithfully the first fruit to the temple. Does that make sense? Give it to the priest. So look what happens in verse uh, in Leviticus 23 verse 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, when you become into the land which I give you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf, an amount, specified amount of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. And when does it happen? When does this get done? On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. What's the morrow after the Sabbath? Sunday. 
Sunday. Anybody remember that uh, John chapter 20 says, and very early on the first day of the week went Mary to the tomb and Jesus resurrected on Sunday. Paul says Jesus is our first fruit. Okay? Get it? Did God know what he was doing, setting things up in his rules way back when to point everything toward Jesus? And day three in this instance? Absolutely. So here's the thing. God's special delivery to us is Jesus, our first fruit from the dead. His being our first fruit then means that God is able to raise his ultimate harvest of believers in the resurrected Jesus. So believers will be resurrected with him because he has been resurrected as the first fruit. And when did that happen? On the day after the Sabbath, Sunday. So does day three matter today or what? Is day three an incredible day today or what? Should every Sunday be celebrated as day three or what by us as believers? Because you guys know as well as I do, we go six days and we kind of get a little weary about oh, the world. So every Sunday, don't we need to just have a, just a little reminder that, hey, Sunday is victory day for me, for all believers. It's hard to imagine a better day than this. When Jesus rose again from the dead and his followers began to realize he had fulfilled his promise, wow, wow, day three is a great day for us too. We understand this today. None of us here have physically seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. None of us have. This is the reason why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is believing that we cannot physically see what we are believing in. So believing in Christ's victory over sin, hell, and death through His resurrection is accomplished how? By faith. Some of us here today have experienced what faith in the resurrected Lord Jesus has meant to our lives. We've experienced it personally. We've even seen how our faith has affected others. Some positively, some maybe not so positively. But it's had an effect. We've experienced the fact that He's brought salvation, hope, help, blessings, leadership, and assurance to us personally. So is that someone you? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone? Have you believed and taken Jesus as your own personal Savior? Get this. The Bible tells us, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, what? That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Day three means our salvation. And Jesus is alive. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and let's stand together this morning? I'm telling you right now, Jesus is alive, and I believe he wants to be alive in your heart today if he's not already. If he is, and man, you just kind of kind of feeling down and weary and hopeless. Maybe today in this invitation we need just a little bit of rekindling of that day three resurrection power. And then maybe, maybe if you've never believed in Jesus today as your Savior, your eyes have been opened and the Holy Spirit is doing a work on your life. Maybe today you would just step out and come forward and 
grab someone by the hand that's down here to pray with you and tell them, you know what, I need to know more about being saved. I need to know more about this faith thing. Maybe somebody here to talk to you and to pray with you and to share scripture with you, the truth about salvation. So Lord, we're just going to leave this invitation in your hands right now, trusting and believing that you're at work in hearts. Give us hope, give us help, give us day three resurrection power just now. In Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to sing this morning, I'm inviting you right now to come. Come and rejoice in the resurrection. Put your faith in Jesus today, in Jesus' name. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide. And His grace so free is sufficient for me. And deep is its fountain, as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from whom they've sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcomes a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. The millions have come. There's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. That's good. Thank you guys so much for your good attention this morning. Let's be dismissed with our benediction. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Great things he has done. Hope to see you again tonight at six. Miss Debbie will be presenting and, and telling us more about Belgium and uh, excited to be able to welcome her back and then uh, Look forward to seeing you back tonight at 6 as well. All right, let's sing together. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, great things He has done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord.